Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Eurodell University. My name is Emil Kalinowski. I'm joined by Jeff Snyder, my co-host, but much, much, much more importantly, we are joined today by, with Russell Napier. Russell, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Emil. We are going to be discussing many things, but we're going to use this book as a launching point to talk about the first financial crisis of the 21st century. At least, Russell, that's how you start out the uh, the book. You tell us this isn't just a history about the Asian financial crisis. You tell us that we're actually learning about this because when the history of the 21st century is written, it will begin with the Asian financial crisis of 1998 and that we're still living with the repercussions of that event. So let's just jump into it. Why did you write this book? Well, I wrote it for, there's, there's actually three reasons. There's never one reason, is there? So I believe that contemporaneous opinion about the future is, is an important field of study. And that's what my first book did. It looked at contemporaneous opinion in the Wall Street Journal and said, the reason that you could tell this was a bottom is because of the errors of forecasting, which were common on all four occasions the errors of opinion which were common on all four occasions. And traditional history doesn't do that. It doesn't bother because it knows the future and it looks back with the benefit of hindsight. So I've just done the same thing again in that perspective, but this time using my own writings because I happen to be in the Asian economic uh, crisis from 1995 to 1998. So that's the first reason I did it. I think there's value in doing that. The second one is I think there was two great clashes of culture underway here in, in, in this period, and I think they continue to clash. And I think we need to understand the difference between, I call it North Asian capitalism and financial capitalism. I think if we understand that more, we work out what the, the future is. And I think it's actually a synthesis rather than a victory for one side or the other. Uh, and the third reason, Emil, is kind of really what that first quote is about, which is, I, say, I think it set the scene for the age of debt. And uh, the foundations were led after the crisis, that, and it's it's conditioned what well certainly the first quarter of this century, and I suspect the policies of the next quarter of the century will all flow from the financial architecture that uh, came along after that crisis. Paul Volcker used to call it the non-system, which I, I mean I always thought was quite funny, uh, but it was a system that's taken us to where we are today. So there's three three good reasons to write the book. The fourth good reason is it brought back some happy memories. Let me take that last point as a jumping off point to tell people that this was a fantastic educational book, but also a delightful look into the amazing life that you led. Here are just some of the notes. Here's just some of the events that happened to you here. You met Oscar winning actors, a US president, the son of Deng Xiaoping, a top jockey who sang with a Manchester United striker in a Paris bar and had drinks with a Federal Reserve chairman in the Bahamas. And it goes on, and that's not everything. It was a delightful, delightful read. But as you say, you are writing, you are taking your pieces that you wrote at that time and developing the story of the Asian financial crisis. And I think we sort of know the story. I think most people that are watching this channel know the broad outlines of the story. But perhaps since you were there, in the thick of it, what might be some items that we've forgotten or that it's easy to overlook, but that you want to bring out, not only just for historical purposes, but that are relevant for today? Yeah, I, th I think the difference in this book and the last one is this one also looks at a market top and not just a market bottom. So I want to sort of focus to, uh, to begin with on how did I see the market top? Uh, and then just in terms of timing, just to point out that I didn't really, you know, I, I think I got lucky on the timing. But let's just look at the, the structural issues that nobody was focusing on, but we all should have been focusing on. So the first thing to say is these countries were all running managed exchange rate regimes. Uh, and that is crucial because it does change the nature of what they can do in monetary policy in terms of the price of money and the quantity of money. And I think obviously the parallel today is China. So what did I see when I went to Asia that in the middle of this economic miracle, I saw these countries with huge current account deficits. And you might say, so what? Lots of countries have them. Uh, but the thing I thought that was dangerous was the way they were funded. So they were increasingly funded with, with lower amounts of long-term capital inflow and higher amounts of short-term capital inflow. Uh, and it was considered obvious that this short-term capital inflow would continue forever. Uh, and that was a mistake. The fatal conceit, right? It's, it's short-term capital inflows and short-term borrowing. It's, it's, ne it's, it's as risk-free and safe as ever, right? 
Yeah, so you beat me to the punch, Jeff, because yeah, short term sorry short term, debt, short term no short term debt was the thing that I really should have I wanted to mention yeah. as well. And the thing about the short term portfolio flows is they were pretty visible because we were all in the market so we could see them. But actually, surprisingly, the, the short term debt flows were fairly invisible because these were not done through bond markets, credit markets. These were done in bank loans. And the bizarre thing was that we were all unaware that this was going on. And the reason that it was bizarre is that we were all working for the same banks. But we were in the stockbroking subsidiaries and the bankers were over in that bit and they were lending all this money. And a lot of it was on three month tenor in dollars. Uh, it was sold in dollars and the money was brought into the local currency for investment slash speculation. So if it had gone back to 1990, a really big chunk of these capital inflows were foreign direct investment. You know, they, they saw assets, they saw cheap assets, they saw cheap labor, they saw export opportunities. But by the time we get to when I arrive in Asia, there's, there's very little of that left. And the idea that particularly the debt, that that could evaporate so quickly, I mean, on a three month tenor, you know, there were a lot of companies came to roll over their debt and suddenly nobody was lending to them. So the, the, the top of the market was conditioned by large current account deficits, very poorly funded. You then had to find the trigger to stop the capital coming in. And that was the crucial thing. You didn't need the capital to go out. When you have a large capital account deficit and you're trying to hold up your exchange rate, you just needed to stop coming. And slowly but surely, various things, which I cover in the book and we may discuss, came along, which stopped it coming. And that's when we started to go on the other side of this managed exchange rate regime and the deflationary impacts of it has an inflationary impact on the on the way up and a deflationary impact on the way down. I think, you know, that's a huge, really important point, too, is that, you know, we think about in terms of capital accounts and things like that. But, you know, some of this is, is just it's opaque. It's hidden. It was as you're, I think, you know, the, the point you're trying to get at here is this was a very different way of doing things. And not everybody really understood what was going on. And that included, obviously, central bankers who were just as behind as the market was because a lot of the stuff was just, you know, it was so radically different than the way it should, or, you know, it had been done in the past. It was like, it was almost, it was, as, as the point you're making, it was like a paradigm shift. Yeah, so when we get to Korea being involved in this, which is quite a long way down the story in October 97, when the IMF gets to Korea and begins to look at Korea's foreign currency debt numbers, they couldn't work them out. I mean, nobody knew what they were. And in fact, they had worked out. They had a number that they thought what it was. And then they discovered that the Korean bank branches in New York had actually borrowed tens of billions more, which they were then feeding into. So we now have, uh, it was really because of the legacy of this crisis that the BIS is putting together much better data on local currency debt, but also foreign currency debt to give us more insight. But that's kind of a legacy. At this time, we didn't know what was going on. So when I began to stumble across it, it was really looking at uh, things like deal logic, which was tracking the syndicated loan flows in Asia. And you could kind of look through that and you could just look at that and go, oh my God, look at all these dollars. And when I showed it to fund managers, they said, I don't believe that. I just can't believe it because we're, inv we're invested in that company and there's nothing in the report and accounts about huge amounts of dollar debt. And you know, this was the striking thing. I mean, the analysts weren't stupid. Uh, there were good analysts in Asia. But all these guys were borrowing in dollars, and for some reason, it just didn't show up in what they were reporting to the marketplace. So there was a lot of hidden. I think things are potentially less hidden today, uh, but certainly at that time, I mean, there was a lot of hidden debt going on. And uh, I mean, who knows? I mean, as you know, the Cayman Islands is a very large provider of credit to everybody. So hiding hiding things is still going on. That's, on. You know, sorry, I, mean, I was just going to say that's why we call them footnote dollars around here because they they don't show up on accounting statements. There's really not any data. You know, there's no data aggregation that shows this stuff. I mean, we try to piece it together through things like tick, and even that's a partial proxy. It, it's really if and even in the footnotes, the footnotes are completely incomplete. You know, they're 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 totally incomplete. They're not they're not real representations, and they're certainly not real representations in real time of what these people are actually doing. So it's, it's, you know, how do you get your hand around all of these dollars? Well, one of, one of the people who helped us put together the Library of Mistakes in Edinburgh was a professor of accountancy called Professor Stuart Hamilton. And he used to have a saying, what the balance sheet reveals, the footnotes take away. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, That's a really good you know, summation wait, of what, what it, we're looking at here. There'll always be something that's hidden, but in capital flows, it's really important. It's not so important when you've got a flexible exchange rate. So I think I would say one thing about this book is it relates more to markets and managed exchange rates. And I've you know called markets and managed and flexible exchange rates. Uh, and it is easier, actually, I, I believe, to call markets and managed exchange rates because when there's one fixed variable in an equation, 
then you've got some hope of solving the other bits of the equation. And uh, this was, I won't say it was easy to solve, but it was alarming how few people were, were working out that this was fixed and everything else was moving around it and it could move in a different direction. Part of the reason, as you explain in the book, is that your timing was perfect for you to observe this because you arrived mid-party. And as you put it, you could see that everyone was inebriated, whereas the people that had got to the party early couldn't quite r recognize how far from the original truth, the kernel, about these economies growing, they've removed themselves from, from moving from foreign direct investment to portfolio inflows. And there was a second thing that maybe was clouding everyone's judgment, and that's a, a cultural interpretation that there's a different way of doing things in Asia and that it's a better way and an unstoppable way and it's always going to continue. Can you talk to us a little bit, a very important part about your book is drawing a distinction between Western capitalism and then how, it, how did you describe it? Uh, Asian capitalism? That's not quite right. It was uh, collective capitalism, putting the society first. Yeah, I, I think this is really important. So there was a thing then called Asian values. Mm. And Asian values was something imposed upon Asia by Westerners looking into Asia. Uh, and if, if it existed anywhere, it probably did exist in the Chinese diaspora, who, as you know, are very powerful business people, particularly in Southeast Asia. But generally speaking, it didn't pervade in society. And the, the so-called Asian values was kind of high-saving, industrious, entrepreneurial people, something they probably lifted straight out of um, uh, capitalism and the, and the um, Protestantism and the capitalist work ethic. You know, it's probably lifted straight from that. But in reality, beyond that, things were very different. And Malaysia, as I'm sure as you know, has you know, three different ethnic groups. And there was a new economic policy trying to create a, cohesion and coherence amongst them. Uh, but up in North Asia, what I call it actually, Emil, is communal capitalism. Uh, in Japan and Korea and China, uh, there is a view that you know, inequalities of wealth shouldn't get too, too great. I mean, inequalities of wealth are great, but you don't see a lot of Japanese businessmen driving around in Porsches. Uh, it's not seen as being, being the right thing. And the same thing in Korea, I remember very well uh, when uh, some of them were driving around in Porsches, they used to get smashed up. So the idea that it was kind of you know, it was all go, go, get them capitalism that pervaded Asia. And the other problem was, what is Asia? I mean, to the West, Asia is a thing. But, you know, I was covering markets that stress from Pakistan to Japan, and they were all supposed to be Asia. Uh, and they were all very, very different. So whatever uh, Western capitalism is, there's an individualism to it. Uh, I think the form that we've been living with for 30 years has far too much dangerous levels of debt associated with it. Uh, and anyway, when the Westerners came to Asia, they said the reason that Asia is going to grow, it has Asian values. And these Asian values are so like what we um, associate with capitalism that it can only go in one direction. And of course, the, the country was running on other people's savings. And that's what a current account deficit is. So it was a kind of a myth and a mythology, uh, but one that was all pervasive. There are books on this, by the way. There's books on Asian values and, and why they were so unique and different and why they guaranteed economic growth, uh, even if you were borrowing all the money, even if you were using other people's savings, it didn't really matter because the values were there. Uh, so I don't know what the, uh, the, 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 what the what the modern or the current comparison is, but that was certainly something that was going on. And just to put it into context for you people watching, uh, um, British pension fund investors had more money invested in Asia x Japan than they had in US equities. Because they believed in Asian values and Asian economic growth, they thought that Asian equities would outperform U.S. equities. And the bizarre thing about all of that is we, if we leave out the disturbance of 98, economic growth in Asia has been higher than the United States of America. But which equity markets performed the best? Certainly not the Asian stock markets. And that was, the, you know, you know, Emil, because you've been on my course, that the uh, one of the first lessons of financial history is there is no relationship between economic growth and the return from equities. And it doesn't matter how many times you say it, people don't get it. They just want to believe the link. So people believe that causal link. They invented the Asian values to justify the link. Uh, and off we went. UK pensions, more money in Asia, ex Japan, than the US by 1996. Absolutely stunning. Uh, we first almost met 
a few years ago in uh, the Cayman Islands. You came down here, you did an interview with Real Vision, and then you presented to the local CFA Society. I missed it because I was flying in from somewhere. It was a huge mistake. I regretted it terribly, so I flew to London a year or so later, and I joined you at your classes, which is a Practical History of Financial Markets. And ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, not taught by an economics professor, but a former lawyer, financial historian, economic historian, who's developed a library of mistakes of human foibles. So it was fantastic. And he brought several people that were in financial markets that worked in real conditions. And you bring that perspective about the real world to financial markets in your course. And recently, that course went online. Is that right, Russell? That's right. So I say recently, next week, that's how recently it is. It'll not be actually live until <laughs> next week. But put my name and the word course into Google and you'll find the link and uh, you'll be able to pre-register if you want to do it this week. But next week, it's eight, nearly 18 hours of video, uh, self-test questions, lots of additional reading material and uh, practical history of financial markets. Rebranded, Emil, as advanced valuation in financial markets, but it's exactly the same thing, just in case you've already taken it once. Please don't take it again, just because it has a different name. And uh, will you be including the lessons from your first book, The uh, Four Great Bottoms of uh, Wall Street? Four yeah, Great absolutely. Market Bottoms. Some of that is incorporated in my uh, in my own lectures. And uh, I try in the in the course to have a bit at the end called, it's called Financial History of the Future. And uh, it's looking at you know, the future. So if I had to sort of focus on one thing about the future, it wouldn't necessarily be my book and Four Great Bottoms. It would be the subject of financial repression. So that you'll find if you sign up for the course, there's quite a lot of teaching on what a financial repression is, how financial markets work in a financial repression. And that's my guess as to the skill set we need going forward. And we can find all that in financial history. So, I'm, uh, so yeah, we do cover the book, but actually I'm covering something which I think will be more important for uh, investors for the next 10 years. I want to talk a little bit about the consequences of the Asian financial crisis. But to do that, I want to dial it back to uh, what you brought up earlier about the no system or the non-system and to the U.S. Treasury Department. I didn't know about this until I read it in your book that the U.S. Treasury Department was maneuvering the IMF for what it thought would be best for who exactly, Russell? Yeah, so it's great. There's a really great quote by Robert Rubin on this, which I'm going to try and find as we're discussing this. So when the IMF came in, and it obviously it's supposed to stabilize the exchange rate. That's effectively what it's there for. And it is really there to bail out foreign banks. That's really what the IMF is for. It's got to make sure that this mess doesn't spread to the rest of the world. And uh, that is that was the history of what happened in the, in the great crisis of uh, uh, the uh, petrodollar crisis, uh, but when it when it arrived this time, it did something different. So I'm going to read this piece from Robert Rubin, and then a piece from Paul Volcker that explains what it did differently. So Rubin wrote a uh, basically an autobiography called In an Uncertain World, uh, and this is what he said about what the IMF should be doing in Asia. If the markets wanted Indonesians to wear blue shirts, would blue shirts become essential to the restoration of confidence? My view was that, by and large, the markets tend to sh shine a spotlight on real economic problems, although they may exaggerate the importance of these problems. In a situation like Indonesia's, foreign investors and creditors might become preoccupied with a symbol, such as the ending of a specific monopoly or the removal of a single corrupt official. But these symbols weren't just blue shirts. In most cases, they related to significant underlying issues, monopolies, corruption, mismanagement and weak financial systems. So that's Robert Rubin's take on what the IMF tried to do in Asia. For many Asians, they would say that the IMF tried to impose somebody else's culture. So it was, some of these were these things, but they actually had huge impacts on the politics of Asia. So President Suharto left office after a very prolonged period of time. There were very significant political eruptions and riots also uh, in Malaysia. So that was uh, Rubin's view. Let me give you Volcker's view on exactly the same subject. Uh, and this is in a book by, called, by uh, Paul Bluestein called The Chastening. Uh, so that I quote now from Volcker. What did spice monopolies have to do with restoring financial stability? Volcker demanded of IMF officials when he arrived at Jakarta. They said, you don't understand. It's run by Saharto's sons. And if we don't do anything about it, nobody will say we're serious. Recalled Volcker, who was still not entirely convinced of the merits of the fund's approach. 
people have different philosophies, said Volcker. The funds business is macro policy, and that's the stuff you can get changed. How programmatic you can be in things that go into basic cultures and economic structures, whether that's productive or counterproductive, but it's a continuing issue. That's all I'd say. So it was a fascinating time because the IMF was definitely trying to change these cultures. Now, the question is why? And was the U.S. Treasury over-involved? And did people in the Treasury have other interests apart from the stabilization of Indonesia, such as opening up the Indonesian financial system for U.S. banks? Those questions remain unanswered in this book because I think they remain unanswered generally as to whether the U.S. Treasury's role in this was as benign as perhaps some people uh, maybe thought it was at the time. It was probably something else going on here. So I mean, there were really important global consequences from this because the, 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 the response of the Asians, I think, was to build up huge foreign exchange reserves after this. Absolutely immense, not just in China, but elsewhere. And that was seen as a buffer, a buffer that meant that they would never find themselves again where the IMF was dictating which politician's son ran which business, who had a monopoly uh, and who didn't have a monopoly. And in running up those surpluses of reserves, they obviously bought a huge amount of treasuries to press the risk-free rate. They undervalued their exchange rates, so they uh, exported deflation to the United States of America. And that's the kind of third bit of this book. It's that by holding down the risk-free rate, by pushing down the rate of inflation, they enfranchised an age of debt where just about anybody could borrow money uh, and gear up asset prices, knowing that the Fed would always be behind you. Because the first time I ever met Paul Volcker, I, you know, I mentioned this in the book, I said to him, you know, rather arrogantly, where did U.S. monetary policy go wrong? to which he replied with four letters, L-T-C-M. And that's what happened at the end of this crisis. It got to America through a thing called L-T-C-M. And the important thing is that the whole U.S. monetary policy was then altered. And the conclusion of everybody in financial markets was, look, if you get into a pickle, Alan Greenspan will cut rates. So a lot of the things that you know we discussed earlier set the scene for this came out of this bizarre approach of the IMF to uh, sort of bring regime change to Asia, really. And uh, the consequences of that were the Asians decided to build up a war chest that would defend them from future regime change. And you take to task the officials at the time. You say that they did a terrible thing, a terrible mistake by letting it slide. And, and we developed a non-system. I think that's Paul Volcker's term. A non-system, instead of doing the hard work, of bringing about, and tell me if I have this right, some sort of new monetary understanding, some sort of Bretton Woods light, some sort of Plaza Accord understanding. And instead we locked in those uh, devalued exchange rates and he here we are. Why did those officials let it slide? Was it just the era, the time, the where we are in the cycle where that sort of heavy lifting wasn't on anyone's agenda and they wanted to... It yeah. came onto the agenda briefly, but you need a lot of political capital to do this. I mean, you need to go into Asia and through whatever means and mechanism persuade them not to run undervalued exchange rates. That's not easy. The second thing is the undervalued exchange rates were a very quick, rapid and cheap way for them to become recapitalized. Uh, if we'd, uh, you know, suddenly the thing was flush with capital, flush with liquidity uh, and was growing again. The alternative seemed to be huge amounts of capital coming from the IMF to do it. So why not allow this I would call surreptitious method of fixing the system uh, rather than the very blunt, obvious political uh, political way of doing it. I, I want to read something from, from Bill Clinton at the time, actually, who recognized all of this and recognized the consequences of not doing something about it. Uh, and he said this at the IMF meeting in 1998. The IMF meeting in 1998, uh, uh, people were absolutely terrified. They really thought we were heading back into another, uh, another Great Depression. Uh, and that's why Clinton made this speech uh, in Washington, D.C., in October 98. Uh, Clinton, if we're going to have a truly global marketplace with global flows of capital, we've no choice but to find ways to build a truly international financial architecture to support it, a system that is open, stable and prosperous. To meet those challenges, I've asked the finance ministers and central bankers of the world's leading economies and the world's most important emerging market economies to recommend the next steps. So that was important. Clinton was recognizing that this was not just about the, you know, the usual G7, but much more than that. There is no task more urgent for the future of our people, for at stake is more than the spread of free markets, more than the integration of the global economy. The forces behind the global economy are also those that deepen liberty, the free flow of ideas and information, open borders and easy travel, the rule of law, fair and even-handed enforcement, 
protection for consumers, a skilled and educated workforce. Each of these things matters not only to the wealth of nations, but to the health of nations. If citizens tire of waiting for democracy and free markets to deliver a better life for themselves and their children, there is a risk that democracy and free markets, instead of continuing to thrive together, will shrivel together. Now, obviously he recognized the importance of it, but nothing was done. Absolutely nothing was done. And in my opinion, we set in place this imbalance, which has taken us where we are today. And it has played a huge role in the inequality, certainly in the developed world, uh, because it took a lot of jobs to, to Asia. And also for those who were fortunate enough to be able to buy assets on leverage in the developed world, it increased their wealth uh, immensely. So the diagnosis was there, Emil, but often there isn't enough political capital particularly on a global basis. Remember, Bretton Woods was founded after the decimation of a world war. Uh, whatever was going on in October 1998, it just didn't generate the sufficient political capital to be able to uh, do this. So I don't know what that system would have been, how equitable it would have been, how successful it would have been. It could have been a failure. But there was no, that new financial architecture for the 21st century was not built. Jeff, it sounds like an echo of benign neglect. Oh, I'm, absolutely. And it's, you know, I think, Russell, maybe you would agree, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's, you know, when we're talking about how much of the, the financial architecture that actually existed in the 90s was essentially shadow or hidden or opaque. It was very difficult for not just regular folks, but I think, you know, people in the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve to connect all these dots. You're talking about political collect, political capital. As we know, as you just said, you know, Bretton Woods came about because of the Great Depression and World War II. It was difficult in 1998 for, you know, as, as good as Clinton had an understanding that it needed to be done, it was next to impossible to say, we need to rewrite the global financial system because there's real weaknesses here when everybody's like, what? What are you talking about? Everything is great. And then the worst part of it, I think, as you, as you mentioned here, is LTCM. So the idea was that, hey, if, think, if push came to shove, we don't need to know the details. The, Alan Greenspan's going to work it out. He's going to he's going to figure out how to deal with this, and the fallout will always be so limited. Why are we upset? You know, why would you possibly? You know, if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? That's that. I think that was the attitude that pervaded back then. But what everybody didn't know was the Fed had no idea. I remember uh, reading through the transcript of the FOMC meeting in September of 1998, where they're talking about LCCM for the first time, and they didn't even know what the hell LCCM was. I think it was one of the conversations Alan Greenspan asked, I think it was Peter Fisher, to pass him the balance sheet for LTCM so they could start discussing it. And Peter Fisher said, what do you need the balance sheet for? There's nothing There's nothing on it worth discussing. So it was, you know, if you can't connect all these dots, you can't raise the political capital. And how do you educate the public, let alone everybody else, about how we need to do these big things? Yeah, I, I think it's a great point because basically what you get is firefighting. And if you constantly fight fires, you find yourself in a very different position than where you wanted to be. Or to put it another way, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So the good intentions were to stop the pain. But every time you put in a new safety net, a new, a new uh, imbalance appeared somewhere else. And that's been really the story of my career. I mean, Ruben uh, was involved in an earlier bailout, which was of Mexico in 1994. Yeah. And that didn't bail out banks. That bailed out a lot of people who were holding the Tessa Bonos. And there's no way they should have been, those people should have been bailed out. So the constant putting of a safety net underneath everything uh, adds to more and more distortions. And they, they couldn't help themselves. Because as you say, they didn't, they, I would say that maybe even if they understood it, they didn't have the political capital to do the root and branch reform that was necessary to make a more stable system. So instead they took the easy way out, which was, you know, bail it out every time it goes wrong. And then finally, after 30 years, you end up where we are today. Uh, Russell, one of the lessons that you mentioned earlier that the Asian countries, I hate to use that term now, uh, learned from this is to build up their reserves. And so many may be watching this and thinking, well, then that's exactly what they did. So there's likely not going to be any trouble. And indeed, when we were talking about China earlier, you said uh, that you were primarily concerned about fixed exchange rates and countries that had uh, current account deficits. And that doesn't describe China. But I know I'm um, I get your other work. So I know there's an ex counter example. We may be looking at China as suffering none of those and being fully protected. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the lesson of Taiwan? Yeah. And so the, the timeline for this crisis is that pressure grows and pressure grows, but Thailand doesn't devalue. Thailand does not devalue its exchange rate until the 2nd of July, 1997. 
And then very quickly, we have a similar thing happening in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and that's Southeast Asia in this crisis. But of course, Asia is much bigger than that. And we're looking at North Asia, particularly Korea and Taiwan. China wasn't so open in those days. And we're all feeling as investors pretty relaxed about North Asia. And for the whole of July, nothing happens up there. And for the whole of August, nothing happens up there. And for the whole of September, nothing happens up there. So we're thinking, well, we're right. And then suddenly things change in October. And that's what I'm going to read to you from the book. Something happened, which I do think has some parallels with where we are in China today. In early October 1997, the crisis spread to North Asia. The Hang Seng Index of Hong Kong, which had reached a new all-time high as recently as August, was falling rapidly. So it actually peaked after the ties devalued the exchange rate. And that's because people thought that's the Southeast Asia thing. It's got nothing to do with all these strong economies up here. On the 10th of October, the authorities in Taiwan stepped away from intervening to support the new Taiwan dollar. And suddenly a North Asian currency had fallen victim to the capital exodus. The currencies of Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines and Indonesia had already devalued, but these were countries running substantial current account deficits. Taiwan was running a current account surplus that was greater than 3% of GDP. And it had it still been forced to do, and it's still been forced to devalue its currency. Taiwan had the third highest level of foreign exchange reserves in Asia after Japan and China, almost triple the level of South Korea and double the level of Hong Kong. If a country with such a large current account surplus and some of the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world could be forced to devalue, then which Asian exchange rate would not devalue in this crisis? Uh, and that is what happened. Suddenly we were all looking at Korea and Korea then, de then devalued. But the question, obvious question is why? If you've got a current account surplus of 3% of GDP and some of the highest foreign exchange rates in the world, why? The answer is, as capital exited, and in their case, it really was banks not rolling over short-term dollar debt. Uh, but as capital exits and you defend your exchange rate, you tighten domestic liquidity and your interest rates go up. And then the question is really, can you live with a higher interest rate? So it doesn't matter how big your reserves are. They're, they're not really that relevant. The reserves are... A, a, a tool that you use, but what the effect of that tool is, is to, to raise rates. Now, if you're in a highly leveraged society, and Taiwan was a highly leveraged society, it was still coming out of this great bubble, which had only peaked in 1989, you can't live with the higher interest rates. Now, that's my point on China. It's, it's really twofold. One, uh, foreigners now do have quite a large stock of liquid RMB denominated securities, which they could sell. Now, that's a new thing in history. That's really never happened before. Even when foreigners invested in China, say, 100 years ago, they were investing in foreign currency denominated instruments issued by the government of China, or they were in foreign direct investment in Shanghai and, you know, in the, uh, in the British quarter of Shanghai or whatever. Uh, so this is new. So that can happen. They can, and then the question for Xi is really quite a big question. Will I allow foreigners to dictate my interest rates? because they would be doing that. And I think I know the answer to that question. And some people might disagree with that, but it doesn't make any sense for me ultimately for China to have a managed exchange rate that allows foreigners to play a role in determining domestic liquidity. This is the world's second biggest economy. It's a proud independent nation. And we're at the coattails of its managed exchange rate regime. Look, if Canada can have an independent monetary policy, I think China can have an independent monetary policy. And with a, over leveraged system with falling property prices and a managed exchange rate. It's a pretty bad combination. So I think there is a parallel with Taiwan and it's not that interest rates go shooting up and bankrupt the whole system. It's that rates go up and the president wants them to come down. And he's not the only president in the world who keeps having expressing this opinion that interest rates should be coming down when the rest of the world thinks they should be going up. Uh, Erdogan is very famous for it, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if we hear the same thing from Xi Jinping fairly quickly if this situation begins to develop. And that's, that's why Taiwan had to develop, sorry, devalue. And that's why I think China will ultimately have to go to a free float. That's right, because we've recently, I've looked at the, I, I don't remember if it was SAFE or the PBOC, but someone's balance sheet that was showing the portfolio uh, status of China, inflows and outflows. And we have seen a switch whereby the portfolio inflows, that fast moving money, stocks and bonds are now outsized larger than the foreign direct investment, which is what you told us happened in Southeast Asia all those years ago. And that money, should it ever be spooked, and there's any number of reasons why it could be spooked, if it starts exiting quickly, to your point, Xi Jinping would then be dictated to as to internal monetary conditions. 
Uh, and yeah, as you say, that's not going to last too long. No, and I, you know, I think this is, there's an overriding high-level point here that we need to reinforce, and that you and I, Emil, we try to reinforce this all the time. And I think Russell's making the same point, which is that, you know, these these national systems are not islands. There is an external internal synchronicity or a dissynchronicity, where if we have an external monetary problem, it be quickly becomes an internal monetary problem, regardless of quote unquote independent monetary policy, because in this type of financial architecture, the shadow money world. Is there really independent national monetary policies? Is it? Are we just telling us? Are we telling ourselves another fiction? Yeah. So, in a world of free moving capital, I think that's the key issue here. You know, as a financial historian, the world changes the day that capital controls are abolished, and just about anything that I've seen happen since then in financial markets is to do with this free movement of capital and the inability of of policymakers really to be able to deal with it, both on the way in and on the way out. Now, sadly, I think that their conclusion from that will be let's bring back capital controls. And it's been long <laughs> been my forecast that that's what it will be. If we look, move into a less global, more nationalist world, uh, and even a country like France, you know, France first. I mean, they used to scoff at America first, but now France first is a big thing. If you go to France first, that means beginning to sort of seal up these relationships that have, as you so rightly point out, have taken away your independence. And that's particularly troublesome in a, in a European Union where the whole point of it was to hand over all of these uh, all of these pull, uh, tools and powers to, uh, to a third party. So, uh, yeah, I think we're retreating. And the ultimate, the ultimate destination of retreat is the reimposition of capital controls. And I do think maybe in a very different form to what we had to what we had historically. But I do think that's the direction of travel. It's easy to say that uh, the, these, these things will go on forever. But ultimately, if they produce political consequences that are unacceptable, they, they do have a way to stop them rather than simply scamper around the world trying to, trying to cope with them. We uh, were talking a lot about Asia, but while you were working there, you had an opportunity to present on the topic of Europe and the single currency, which you did, which you just raised right now. And it's a very funny story in the gallows humor sort of sense, where you got a round of applause from two individuals. And as you write in the book, that gave you the chills because it gave you a a look ahead to the future, that future, are we there now? Are we heading to that future that gave you that chill? Tell us the story about the round of applause you got about the single currency. Yeah, I, I can actually feel those chills running up my spine again, now that you've mentioned it. But I was uh, asked, living in Hong Kong, working for a French bank, to present to a visiting committee of the French Senate, who were there to investigate the Asian financial crisis. Now, it was my opinion, forecasting in advance and living through it, that, they, that the root cause of that was trying to jam all these currencies together against the dollar. And that what that did was create huge imbalances. And all we were doing was living through the unwinding of those imbalances. Uh, and my, I suggested to them that if they tried to create a euro, remember this was, nine, this was before the euro, if you try to do that, you'll create exactly the same thing. Massive imbalances of the current account, capital account, Dead. And I think history did vindicate me, given what happened in, in uh, Europe in 2012. There were massive imbalances that were unwound, which led to mass private sector bankruptcies and even some government defaults on debts on domestic currency, effectively, in, in places like in places like Greece. Uh, but anyway, that was my opinion. I then got a speech from one of the members of the French Senate who said that what I didn't take into account here is how single currencies could make everybody the same, how there were lots of inefficiencies in Europe. And what a single currency would do would be to grind down those inefficiencies, make everybody more efficient, make them more similar, and create a greater prospect for peace across Europe. Now, all I said to him was that what you call inefficiencies in this room in Hong Kong, in France, that's called culture. You know, the fact that every little town has three bakeries is one of the reasons that we love France, and, and you know, it's a large part of being French. But if you want to grind all that out of the system with a single currency, you're not going to you're not going to stop a war. You're going to start a war. That's when I got the standing ovation in the mail from these two people, and I was it was instantly rushed out of the room. <laughs> and the, uh, yeah. the French consulate was outside, at Monsieur Boileau, who I used to know quite well, and I said to Francois, well, what what's happened? Who are these two guys who gave me the standing ovation?" And he said, "Oh, you can ignore them. That was the fascist and the communist." <laughs> And, and that is why the chill ran up my spine, because I realized that by imposing, I mean, this is not only with the European Union, this is to do with a single currency. By imposing that single currency and ironing out these so-called inefficiencies, you would be destroying 
the bit of a culture to which people hold dear. And you would send them, I thought, more to the right than the left, but you would certainly send them to extremists who would offer to protect them from that sort of thing. And I think that's exactly where we are. So the French, let's just, I don't know what the right term we have for Le Pen and Zemmour these days, but let's just say further to the right than they, further to the right than normal right. Let's just call them that. I mean, they're polling about 36% of the vote, maybe up as high as 40% of the vote. I mean, it's a hell of a big polling number and the communists are not doing so well, but the far right's doing quite well. So, yeah, I mean, I think that is that, you know, that when I sat there and listened to that, I thought this is where we're going to end up. And I would argue that we're quite a long way down that path and it, you know, it's not a good thing. So I, and I, just one other thing, because I think it's really important. Many people say this was some sort of clever plot by a dominant economic force in Europe to get a cheap currency. It wasn't. I mean, my experience in that room was that this man who gave me the speech was really desperately committed. He lived through the Second World War. He desperately believed that this was the answer. I mean, he just came up with the, he asked the right question. He just disastrously came up with the wrong answer. And I think that's what Europe has done. It's come up with the wrong answer to the right question. And, uh, you know, we, we, we could talk for 90 minutes about the way back. Uh, and there has to be a way back. But we are where we are. And, yeah, I absolutely think that most of that, what I learned in that room all those years ago, has really come true. Are you working on explaining that way back in a, uh, a sequel to your book? So you started out with the Asian financial crisis. Are you writing The Age of Debt? And is there, is there a third book that would then be The Age of Financial Repression? So the, you, you're exactly right. That's exactly what it's going to be called. But I better find the snappier uh, first bit for that. But that is exactly what it's going to be called. And The Age of Financial Repression, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, is kind of a synthesis between us and that communal capitalism. Uh, and it is taking away some key market signals, um, particularly the price of money. Uh, and I think for Europe, it is a move to the internal capital controls, which de facto, if not the euro, is the end of the euro, but not in some sort of spectacular bust up, just that by constraining and holding capital within various countries, you create different levels of inflation there. And eventually with the, you know, the competitiveness that we were trying to make everybody competitive at the right levels of productivity. That all goes away, and we run our route away from a, a single currency. And uh, I, I don't think I have to write the book now because you summed it up in about two lines. But that's, that was a very accurate summation of what the uh, – I was going to say the final book, but it may well be the final book is all over. Russell, when you wrote the book uh, – when you, you didn't write the book. You, you wrote your reports. It was pre-crisis. So as you explained to us, it was a little bit, uh, you worked for some great people and you had great support from the top. So you can make these out of step, out of consensus forecasts. But as you know, uh, it's, there's a timeline, you know, you have to be within uh, some period of time for this forecast to come right. Otherwise they'll just consider you a crank or a perma bear like Jim Grant. Right now, you're going around, you're meeting with people. You have to tell us about Eric and the other work that you do. Uh, and you're talking to fund managers and investors, and you're telling them about the age of financial repression. Where do you think we are in that cycle? Like, when will everyone else be clued in that there is a, a new era that we have begun? How far away is that undeniable moment? So my main job is to advise professional investors and that's what I've been doing since 1995 and that's what I continue to do so I meet a lot of them and they all work for institutions there is a subscription by the way for individuals now as well for the first time but uh, I would put it this way so I'm a lawyer as you mentioned I stumbled into this job by by accident and when I got into it I would find lots of other people who'd stumbled into it by accident but th something changed in the last 30 years it filled up with people who'd been educated in it uh, and they'd been to business school and studied finance. And what they learned in finance was supply and demand. Uh, and why not? Why wouldn't you learn that in finance? Supply and demand, isn't, what, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that what economics is all about? Well, if you read financial history, the answer is no. <laughs> because there are some times when, you know, just like uh, Jack Nicholson and a few good men, you want the truth. You can't handle the truth. You know, the governments can't live with the consequences of price. Uh, you know, there are lots of examples of this. Uh, so I argue today that the governments can't live with the consequences of price. And therefore, and this is absolutely crucial, if you remember nothing else about our discussion, 
what your viewers should remember is this. We have severed the link between the discount rate and the growth rate. It is, it is severed now for a generation. On that statement alone, everything you learned at university about finance and economics no longer applies. So we, we got to retrain ourselves. Uh, that's a really long preamble to say that most people I speak to are business school and financial educated. So they just don't want to believe it. I mean, you can talk to your blue in the face about financial repression, but they, you know, it's like, you know, I, does not compute, does not compute, does not compute. These are parameters with which I cannot deal and I will not deal with those. So I will pretend that this is the system we live in. Because otherwise, you're telling me that entire degree and my 30 years of experience is all irrelevant. And I'm saying, yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Uh, there is an easy shortcut to cope, cope with this. Uh, as what I say to my clients, look, if you really want to manage money in the new system, you don't have to go and retrain. All you need to do is hire a Brazilian and a South African. And uh, they know exactly how to run money in a financial repression. So, you know, the skill set exists because there have been repressive regimes in the world that we've lived in. So hiring some of those skills uh, you know, keep an eye on them uh, and let these guys get get on with it. But I, yeah, there's, you know, I, I think it's when a, when an ideology changes, most people are reluctant to admit that the old ideology is gone, and that's where we are today. And particularly for fund managers, it's very very difficult because they realise that there'll be a lot less fund managers around in a world of financial depression. <laughs> Jeff, do you have any questions about the Asian financial crisis, China, the future, no, economic I, you know, history? I, I think there are really some really good points. And I think this is the overriding point that we're making now is you know, how, especially the financial services industry being a member of it, how so much of it runs on these myths and shorthands and legends and theories that they work really nice in the classroom on the chalkboard. But then you run into somebody like Russell who has practical experience and tries to tell you from practical experience, maybe the world doesn't work the way that you've been taught it works there is this tremendous amount of resistance. And if, I think yeah, I actually find it uh, more so from the old guard rather than new students, you know, younger people who are maybe a little bit more eager to learn something that sounds a little bit closer to their own personal reality. But, you know, you can understand why economists, for example, are, are they, uh, they hold on to their econometric model like they're, they're children because what you're really saying is you've developed an unrealistic model of how the world doesn't actually work. And so... You know, maybe your whole life's work isn't really worth what you thought it was and that we need to get beyond it. And to get beyond it, we need you to understand that there are some practical applications of things that are well beyond your experience or even your, your education. Yeah, I think it's worth adding to that as well. There's another problem because the fin- if you're going to run a, f- a financial repression, you have to conscript the financial system to do it as government. And therefore, what is the real value of the opinions of those who work for that system? if you're an investor trying to manage your money. Uh, I mean, on another example, China, a lot of these institutions are heavily involved in China, see China as the growth. Are they really going to tell you the truth about China? <laughs> yeah. So the more that this system is conscripted, the more you can expect it to hold on to the old narrative because it really doesn't want to re- recognize or let us be more frank, reveal that there's a new system coming along. So you need independent outsourced opinion, which is by way of a little advert for my other business, Eric, where we try to get lots of great independent researchers to sell the research on on Eric. But the financial system is compromised now. Uh, I think many people watching this would say, hasn't it been compromised all along? Well, yeah, but it's degrees of compromise. And its ability and willingness to provide you with independent opinions are shriveling rapidly. And uh, so that plays into what you just said, Jeff. Russell, tell us anything else about uh, where people can find you? You just told us about the independent research that they can find at ERIC, E-R-I-C, the course we talked about. Where can they go to learn more about your work? And for the audience that's listening right now, in the show notes, I'm going to put links to some of Russell's recent interviews on different shows. And then, as a final parting gift for the audience, Russell, please tell us the story about the president and the buffet table. Uh, so the, the, I guess the one final thing I haven't mentioned, uh, I and mean, it was uh, as of January this year, I was finally able to work out a regulatory way that I could sort of set up subscriptions for individuals. So russellnapier.co.uk uh, is where you go if you're an individual. And if you're an institution, for regulatory reasons, you have to come uh, through Eric. So uh, 
I'm sitting in Hong Kong and the Far East Economic Review, which is one of the saddest losses to all of us, to what happened to that newspaper. It was a wonderful newspaper magazine, ran a conference. The keynote speaker was George Bush Sr. George Bush Sr. had been in China in the, I think it was the 70s. So he knew it really very well. Uh, and he got up and he gave really a very optimistic speech on, on China, which is largely proven to be to be true. But this was the pre-lunch thing. Now, Everybody watching this has probably been to a conference and you know exactly what happens. As soon as the conference breaks for lunch, you better get first in the queue for the buffet because if you're not first in the queue for the buffet, there's a queue of 300 people for the buffet. So I sat at the back and instantly ran up to the buffet. And when I got there, the only other person there was George Bush Sr. <laughs> and I said to him, what are you doing here? He said, well, I find if I don't get to the buffet quick enough, I don't get anything to eat. So the two of us, everybody else was folding their papers and talking down in the hall. Uh, and we stood there with our volivants and discussed the future for China. So, I, I mean, I, I say the moral of the story is always true. There's more than one reason to get to the buffet early. Those little anecdotes pepper this book, ladies and gentlemen. I enjoyed it very much, The Asian Financial Crisis. I do not receive any royalties for my advertising, but I do highly recommend it. Russell, thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on getting your course online, and I can't wait to talk to you again. Great. Uh, Emil, Jeff, thanks very much. Keep up the good work. Yeah, thanks, Russell. We really appreciate it. I think it was a really great discussion. So uh, you know, thank you for taking the time for us. No problem.